Ignoring the politicized and attention-seeking content surrounding the show from both sides, is it actually worth watching? Hey everyone, let's take a holistic look at the first season of Rings of Power. Let's begin this journey with a 2013 quote from Christopher Tolkien himself, which he gave after 40 years of media silence. They gutted the book, turning it into an action movie for 15 to 25 year olds, and it seems The Hobbit will be of the same ilk. Tolkien has become a monster, devoured by his popularity and absorbed by the absurdity of the time. The gap that has grown between the beauty, the seriousness of the work, and what it has become, all that is beyond me. Such a degree of commercialization reduces the aesthetic and the philosophical scope of this creation to nothing. I have only one solution left, to turn my head. Make no mistake, this show, just like The Lord of the Rings before it, is fan fiction. This task was appointed to you, and if you do not find a way, no one will. The difference is that Peter Jackson decided to stay as close to the source material as it would allow him to tell his version of the story, which he did in a grandiose cinematic fashion. In contrast, Amazon tried to turn it into something for everyone, not for altruistic or progressive diversity reasons, but purely for financial ones. But for whatever reason they did it, Rings of Power is not a catastrophe or bastardization, nor is it the cinematic achievement it could have been, but it's somewhere in between. So let's take a look at the story first. If Sauron has returned, then the Southlands are in grave danger. The Southlands are but the beginning. I will not tell you that it deviates from Tolkien's original, because that is a given. Of course it does. It has to. And none other than Tolkien himself could have done it justice. And I think many people seem to underestimate how rare of a case such a faithfully brilliant adaptation like Jackson's movies is. Because not only do you have to find someone that is insanely passionate about the source material, and is also capable enough to translate it onto the page, but also has the talent and the artistic freedom to bring that onto the screen as well. Jackson's trilogy was a perfect storm where almost all the elements came together in just the right way to make it possible. Not only do most people not have the talents of Peter Jackson, but the globalized and commercialized times we live in also predetermine the paths that you have to take to get to your goal. Very much like Frodo and Sam were taken on the road of Seritongol, you're bound to run into trouble, even though it's not your fault. Say that again. The fate of the entire elven race is in your hands. And the story itself, however much it may deviate from the original, is very well told. You essentially see the rise of Sauron through the eyes of the elves, the Numenorians, the Uruks, the humans and the Halffoots, as the show keeps jumping between them in order to show all the pieces coming together, highlighting how big of a world-spanning threat Sauron actually is. And they bind these elements together pretty well, until they all collide into a well-handled season finale, which, unfortunately, as was to be expected, ends with a massive cliffhanger. We are on the cusp of crafting a new kind of power. The only thing that can be leveled against it is that some elements could have used more time to develop, but considering how expansive the world of Tolkien is, I don't think you could ever really do that properly, and that the flow of the show isn't optimal because some of the jumps between the several groups are so far apart that you may end up forgetting what they were up to to begin with. But all in all, it's better than could have ever reasonably been expected. But how does the cast manage to bring these characters to life? Pretty darn good, actually. While it all stands out a bit stiff and generic, much of the cast manages to find themselves in their roles at the end, this may also be because many of the more one-dimensional characters that were created for this show are pushed to the background in the later episodes as they were used as world-building or setups for the characters and things to come. Daniel Wayman as the Stranger, Lloyd Owen as Elendio, Joseph Maul as Adar, and Peter Mullen as King during the third do a particularly good job of bringing their characters to life. Wayman has this curiousness and childish softness of a certain wizard. Owen has the kingly nature you would expect from a leader of men. Maul delicately delivers the violent but inner brokenness of the first Uruk, looking for a new homeland. And Mullen elegantly carries the weight of an old king, burdened by defending his kingdom, in fear of everything unknown or new to him, even if it may come from within. 
The rest of the cast varies from okay to good, but the chemistry between Robert Aramayo and Owen Arthur, as Elrond and Durin, I liked quite a bit. The one problematic performance, unfortunately, is Morphe Clark's portrayal of Galadriel. I don't know if this is the portrayal she chose for the character or if it was put upon her, but she seems incredibly uncomfortable in this role and stiff in most of the shots. It looks as if her interpretation of the tough character means that Galadriel isn't allowed to blink or move in much of her face, and it also looks like she's trying to imitate the gracious movement of Kate Blanchett's version, but confuses it with trying to stay as static as possible while only moving the necessary extremities, which makes her look very robotic at times. And considering that her character is supposed to be this wise leader and hundreds of years old, whenever she shares those sentiments and thoughts, the lack of emoting and stiff performance and some often unnecessarily aggressive and cookie cutter lines turn her character into a burden for the show. While she definitely looks the part, I don't think she was suited very well for this role, which is made even worse by the unbalanced script, which doesn't seem to know what this version of Galadriel should be like as a character or for the story especially in the last three episodes of the season. Clark was, unthankfully so, handed a role that could have never really worked the way it was set up. The moment we feared. The rest of the show is pretty great. Bear McCreary's soundtrack hits a lovely balance between grandiose and intimate, while having a different tone and theme for every folk. The same thing can be said for the art design as well, which effectively visualizes the differences between those folks in clothing, architecture, armor, and color. It's all brought to life with great cinematography, often inconspicuous but good world building, and a fantastic soundscape, and with the unbelievably high quality visual effects which make most modern blockbusters look cheap. This version of Middle Earth is wonderfully realized, and a step or two above everything else out there right now. Wings of Power doesn't do the source material justice, because it simply can't. Being realistic about how expansive Tolkien's world is, how limiting the licensing issues are, how crazy the political landscape and entertainment is, and very importantly so, that most people in Hollywood are not as talented as Peter Jackson, Rings of Power is better than I honestly thought it ever could be. If you try to see this show as the Tolkien fanfiction that it was always meant to be, without comparing it to the singularly incredible Lord of the Rings adaptation, which was also much maligned by some of the same fan base back in the day, I think that you can thoroughly enjoy Rings of Power. I did not cross that bitter ocean. No need to drown now. I'm honestly looking forward to the second season, and with that said, thank you very much for watching, and if you liked this video, you might enjoy this one as well. And with that said, I will see you in the next one.